Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet, in our opinion. I am exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. I am Bob. And today, my guest is a return guest. My first return guest is going to be Sarah Meeks. Uh, I'm going to just keep this very uh, short and simple. She is the go-to person with regard to osteoporosis. Everything you need to know about osteoporosis, especially non-medical treatments as far as uh, uh, medicine, um, she's the person. So you know, want to maybe check out today's uh, podcast, but you also want to check out one that we did with her recently. It's called Osteoporosis. There is something you can do. An interview with Sarah Meeks. Uh, it's also on YouTube. We'll have the links below. Um, it, it's a very popular video, by the way, at over 75,000 views. So, and, and by the way, I also want to mention right away at the beginning here that she will take your emails and answer your questions and also send you handouts. So her email is jharrison. I'll spell it out, J-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N-2 at earthlink.com. Earthlink. Dot, I'm sorry, not dot com, dot net. Jay Harrison to at earthlink.net. Check it out. Give her a, give her an email. Hope you enjoy the show. Sarah Meeks, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Well, it's Looking really a, our pleasure. I mean, <laughs> your last uh, video and podcast was a huge hit. Um, <laughs> it's had at least 75,000 views and, uh, Still getting quite quite a few day, views a day, so oh. really glad to have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I must admit um, I haven't had a response like that from anything else. So you've got a big following, and I got awesome. I, I received emails from all over the world, basically, and I've done a few consults, and hopefully everybody is happy with that. Well, well deserved. And, well deserved. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. So. You wanted to start today with a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, yes. Just to, I think it would be really interesting. So. Okay, be, before I do that, I'd like to tell who, I don't know how many are there. I'd like to say welcome to this oh. podcast. And we are going to be doing a couple of breathing exercises. And one of them is a forced exhalation through the nose. And so everybody wants to have a handkerchief or a tissue or a paper towel or something that you can blow your nose with before you start the breath. Gotcha. So that will be in the PowerPoint and I'm going to lead you through it. So gotcha. it's, it's not right at the very beginning. So you've got a couple of minutes to gather whatever you need uh, to blow your nose. So, um, cause otherwise it could be a problem. All right, I'm, so I'm ready to go then. Don't use, right. don't use your shirt sleeve. Huh? Don't use your shirt sleeve. Yeah, that's right. Don't. <laughs> well, we can't see what they're doing anyway. That's right. So that's right. They I guess, I guess that, 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 that's okay. Okay, so I'm going to share this, and then I'm going to get to the slideshow here. So if you and... are listening on the podcast, um, You'll, you'll have to miss this part of it, but we'll start with just pure talking later on. Okay. All right. So uh, the first thing that I'd like to uh, do is tell you a little bit about what is the Meeks method. And I thought the best way to demonstrate this was what I call the Meeks method wheel, which shows that the Meeks method is not just a bunch of exercises, it's a comprehensive approach to spinal health, to bone health, particularly with my focus on spinal health um, and osteoporosis. So you can see that there's a lot to it. Yep. Some of you watching this are therapists. You don't have to go around the wheel in a clockwise. You can, you can uh, use this wheel however you like. Um, and for those of you who are not therapists or medical professionals, also for you, let's say, for example, one of the big comorbidities, it's called, that means it's another uh, disease or condition that someone has, 
is called emphysema or uh, COPD. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very common comorbidity with osteoporosis. So I would begin that patient more with breathing and relaxation. Uh, Everybody has to go through an assessment process, of course. That's at the top. Uh, Let's say that um, someone has fallen several times in the last couple of months. I would focus on balance. Let's say someone has had compression fractures in their back. I might go right to the bracing along with the exercises. Sure. Everybody gets body mechanics training, how to, how to live your life in a safer way. So it's a more comprehensive approach. Uh, you can call any physical therapy practice in the United States of America and maybe in other parts of the world and ask them if they see patients with osteoporosis and they'll probably say yes. But it doesn't mean they have a plan. It doesn't mean they have a protocol. It doesn't mean they have a comprehensive approach, which I found it really takes because of the variety of the people that have the condition. So, uh, Sarah, I wonder if I can make a comment. Um, yeah. First off, on that on that slide, all of the most of those things are important to everyone, even if you don't have Oscar. Oh yes. Oh so, yes. It's not like a a waste of your time if you're doing these things. It's Mm -hmm. almost all important. Yes. And um, uh, the thing is that this program, uh, even though my focus has been on osteoporosis and particularly of the spine, uh, because we do have protocols for the hip, hip fractures and so on, less so for the spine, is the, the, the comorbidities that uh, can occur uh, can be just about anything from a neurological issue, joint replacements, uh, arthritis conditions, and so on. So yeah. all of exactly. that has to be taken into consideration while you're also working with people with bone health issues. It sure. can be, it can be, that's where it gets, for me, as a therapist, Uh, The most interesting, although all my patients are interesting and I help them out as much as I can, but when I have someone come in, you know, who's had eight or nine compression fractures and also has lost six or eight inches of body height uh, and has heart arrhythmias and uh, maybe some breathing issues and maybe has had a couple of joint replacements and has a scoliosis besides, that's when it gets really challenging that's a challenge osteoporosis does not occur alone maybe in younger people it does but it doesn't in the old in the in the elderly so alignment 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 to me is the key with better body alignment function follows form there is a great emphasis in physical therapy these days on better function Well, if you have better form, better alignment, you're going to be more efficient, you're going to be safer, you're going to have less pain, uh, and so on. It also gives an opportunity for more site-specific muscle contraction, and we're going to go through that. One of the questions is on which muscles I pick for strengthening and which muscles I I pick that probably need more stretching. So you could be much more specific with the muscles and also with weight bearing forces. And also if you have better body alignment, and this is really important, it provides more room for the internal organs. So the next slide is a picture of your internal organs. In, In osteoporosis, if you start to have fractures in your back, you probably will also lose body height. Body height loss can affect all of those items there and maybe even more, any internal organ function. The most common are uh, breathing and heart rhythm. People develop heart arrhythmias when they start to have compression fractures and because of of the pressure on the lungs, they can also have difficulty in breathing, but it can affect any and all of the internal organs. And one of the problems that I have found with that is that when they go to see a physician, let's say for their heart problem, the physician will focus on just the heart. Well, he should, you know, or she, the physician. Uh However, you know, if you look at the patient's record and you find that they've had compression fractures or just the osteoporosis 
or maybe a scoliosis secondary to osteoporosis, that does happen, that maybe they should look at the back too and see what's going on there that may cause the increased pressure on the heart and the lungs. The most common cause of death in people with osteoporosis is a heart attack and pneumonia. So that's the heart and the lungs. And we know the way, and you can see on the figure on your left, the spine has curves to it. And that area is basically designed to help protect the heart and lungs. Okay, and here's another, I wanted to emphasize the alignment. So we have three diagrams or pictures of the spine. On the left is what's from the front view. You're looking at the front view of the spine, the vertebral bodies. On the right, you're looking at the back view. They're called the spinous processes that run straight up from the sacrum, which is the, that big bone at the bottom. But I'm concerned about the middle one, which is highlighted as you see, uh, because of the curves of the spine. And so the exercises that I do, I've designed specifically to protect the curves, the natural curves, the optimal alignment of the spine, beginning with the coccyx or the tailbone way down at the bottom, you'll see it's curved under. And then the next bone up is the sacrum, which goes the other way. And then in your lower back, you see from L1 to L5, that means lumbar vertebra one through five, you have what's called a lordosis, a forward curve in the spine. And then when you come up to T1 down to T12, you have the curve going the other way. So that's a kyphosis type uh, posturing. And then the neck, the uh, cervical spine, then you have the balance. So you have a balanced spine. So in the mix method, I do not teach pelvic tilts because most of the time when people tilt their pelvis, they flex the lumbar spine, which means they bend it. They take it the other way. So I don't do that. What I do is I take a little dowel when they're lying on their back and I lie and I put it underneath the lower back and have them feel the weight on the dowel and not change it while they're doing the exercise. So they maintain the curve in their back or the same thing for the neck. Um, Sarah, so what, was that, what was that you said you put under their back? A dowel, D-O-W-E-L, oh, a, okay, gotcha. a stick, about gotcha. a one inch diameter, you know, and sure. it's not really... It's not really specific where you need to put it. You need to put it in the lordosis just so they can feel it. So it in doesn't change. Yards. And the same thing for the neck, for the cervical spine. I don't have people flatten the lump or the cervical spine either. I want to maintain the natural arches and curves in the spine as much as possible. So gotcha. that's a little bit about how I, it's a little different than a lot of other people do. So most of the fractures occur below, it's called T6. That's your thoracic spine, vertebra number six. Okay, you have 12 uh, in, this, in this area. So uh, this is where most of the fractures occur. This is also an area of the body where there are no muscle attachments. So if we talk about strengthening the bones by muscle contraction and you have an area where there's no muscles, which is, this is one of them, um, this uh, lower, this mid to lower thoracic spine, there are no muscles attached to the front of the backbone. There are muscles on the back and there are muscles in the neck and there are muscles in the lower back. Gotcha. But uh, the, in this area, there are not. And this is the area between T6 and T11 or T12 where most compression fractures occur. So the question so, becomes, so, so how do Sarah, we that? Hmm? That, that would be right around the lower end of the shoulder blade? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's still in the thoracic curve. Right. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. So here's another picture. I call it the front of the backbone. And there's T6, and I put those little yellow circles there too. Yeah. And that, those are, this is where most fractures occur in the spine. And so my, and our job as therapists is to simultaneously protect and strengthen this area of the spine. So gotcha. how do we do it if there are no muscles attached? Well, uh, that's the treatment dilemma that I call it, that, you know, how do we do this? 
Well, my sort of, um, I'm going to put this in quotes, answer, because I'm not sure I have a lot of answers. I have a lot of ideas. But my answer or my idea is to improve alignment of the spine so that you get the forces going through the vertebral bodies in a more anatomically correct manner. And so one of the questions is going to be on that the Bob is going to ask me. So I'll just visit real quickly. Sure. Uh, there's, a, there's a group of muscles that run up the back all the way from the tailbone, all the way up to the base of the skull, the whole thing. They're called your back extensors. And the research has shown that strengthening of this muscle group, this is your Marshy Sanaki work, actually reduces the risk of compression fracture on the other side of the spine. Well, how does that happen? The muscles aren't attached there. So I was over in Italy a few years ago, and I went to the keynote speaker. Um, I, his name um, always escapes me. It'll probably... Dieter Felsenberg, Felsenberg was his name. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, well, we know that muscle contraction is necessary to strengthen bone. So we want to target the muscles that are attached to the bone to strengthen the bone. Right. I said, so how is it that if you strengthen a muscle on the back of the spine, that reduces the fracture risk on the front of the spine where the, there's no muscle attachments. So this is what he said. He said, well, he said, I haven't, there's no research that I know on it. You know, this, this guy's a real researcher and a very high up in the osteoporosis uh, world, sure. as, it, as it were. He said, but uh, the, I would postulate that what happens is that the muscle contraction exerts a tensile or lengthening force on the front of the vertebral bodies. And so that is a force that may help to strengthen those bones in the front, even though the muscles in the back. I see. It. Yeah. So that's what he said. And so here's my comment on that. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. There you go. He's at the top of his field. I don't have any other answer to that. Yeah. So anyway, there are any number of people who wanted information on yoga. So I thought I'd put this little statement in here. In yoga classes, lots of yoga teachers ask you to tuck your tailbone. So I say, don't bother. It's already tucked. The problem is if you tuck the tailbone, or in other words, you curl it under, your tendency is to do a posterior tilt of the pelvis, and a flexion of the lumbar spine. Now, I'm going to show a slide on the flexion because a lot of people might not understand that, uh, but it's a reverse curve and it may cause a fracture because of that, that pressure. But I'll show another slide on that too. Yeah, good. Okay, so the first question that Bob's going to ask is if, uh, unless I answer it all first, oh no, I've got a couple other questions. Uh, usually, I begin with all of my patients now with the breath. A lot of them are fearful. A lot of them are anxious. A lot of them have had bad, bad, bad advice until somehow they figure out, you know, they kind of stumble on. Somebody just sent me an email from Bob and Brad and said, I just stumbled on your, on your name with Bob and Brad. And, yeah. and I've been looking everywhere for some help. So I usually start with the breath and relaxation, just to calm people down and tell them that, that they can live a full life with osteoporosis. You know, it just means they may have to modify their movement. Sure. And some of their ideas about their own body and some of the exercises that they've loved all these years, they have to give up. I had to do it. Yeah. So they may have to do it too. So, and then after they're comfortable just noticing how they're breathing. A lot of people pay no attention to their breath until they can't breathe. And so that then I ask them to begin to control the breath. Just slow it down. Close your mouth. Breathe in and out through the nose. If you have trouble breathing in and out through your nose, practice it because it will get better. It's better for your overall health. That's probably a whole other webinar to do. But anyway, 
uh, because open mouth breathing is very unhealthy and uh, our nose contains certain uh, uh, fibers and things that, that kind of filter the air uh, before it gets into the lungs, which I think is really important. So we start with the breath and then you'll probably get tired because you're not used to doing this, breathing slowly. So I just say, well, don't get too excited about it. It's okay to relax and just go back to your normal breath. And then when you feel like starting up again, just start up again. You'll get better at it with practice. I, I have to say, Sarah, I've been a, yes. doing a lot of reading on the breathing lately. And I agree with you 100% about the nose breathing versus mouth breathing. Oh, yes. I was a mouth breather and I've trained myself to become a nose breather. Oh. And my blood pressure went down and uh, my anxiety levels certainly oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah anxiety levels and in osteoporosis diagnosis there is a lot of anxiety sure I mean, yep I, understandable I've met, I've met now people in their 40s and early 50s that have been diagnosed with osteoporosis so that is considered fairly young but yes it comes younger than that and they're so anxious about what they're going to be like when they're 80 Right. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's 30 years away, you know, yeah. <laughs> let's work with today, you know, let's right. this right. crazy, you know, calm yourself down and, and live today and, and start today. And then when you get to be 80, somebody said, you know, if, if you envision how you're going to be at 80 or 90 or whatever, you know, and, and you take that inside yourself, everything you do will, will lead you in that direction. You may have bumps along the way. I mean, I don't know, um, but, you know, it, think positively or, or diminish negativity, I call it. Right. Uh, yeah. And then I did a webinar with a gal by the name of Sharon Salzberg. I don't know. She's a very, very well-known yogic yogi and uh, does a lot of webinars and teaching on uh, meditation and the breath and so on. And so she said, you don't have to work at this. You know, in America, we got to work at everything. We're going right, to be right. stronger. We got to go, you know, go up, you know, whatever. She said, just settle back and let the breath come to you. Your body will breathe automatically. Sure. Just, let it, just let it breathe. Just notice that it's doing it. That in and of itself can bring anxiety level down. Did you, do yep. you have the book? Do you have the book Breath? Yep. Yeah, that's a great sure. book. Oh, that's a great book. That's a great book. Yep, I have that too. So anyway, the first thing to do is to relax and slow down, not to take a deep breath necessarily, just a slow breath, okay? So hopefully everybody's got their Kleenex because we're getting ready for this. Now this is, um, that's not me. I wasn't the subject for that one, but uh, I don't know um, who it is. The diaphragmatic, and I, and I imagine, I tell people, to imagine that they have a balloon in their abdomen when they do diaphragmatic breathing. Or you can just put your hands on your abdomen as you see the person here. Or sometimes I have people put their cell phone right there. And I'll say, okay, now, and I don't use the word diaphragmatic breathing because it's a big word. People are worried about not doing it right. I'll say, now, look, you've got this cell phone right, right about the level of your navel or just below. And I'll say, now, when you breathe in, push the push the phone up, okay? When you breathe out, pull it back down. When you breathe, just keep pushing it up. I love it up. that. That's push great. Up. That's a great cue. <laughs> or inflate the balloon and deflate the balloon, whatever. Perfect. Or you could put a little weight there. I wouldn't put a, more than two pounds, but just, just, I mean, eventually you can put more weight so that you're doing more resistance, but you know, to begin with, you put a little one pound or two pound weight there. It's all it is, is a refer re reference point for your sure. breathing. Yeah. So that's, that's the way I teach diaphragmatic breathing. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people think, you know, when you to breathe correctly, you're supposed to bring it into the chest and really you want to oh. bring the air into the diaphragm. Yeah. And we're, we're going to, um, I think that I have a little bit on this for the diaphragm excursion too, because uh, the diaphragm, as you know, probably descends into the abdomen area as you inhale and that it ascends uh, when it relaxes. And it has a certain excursion. 
Now, there are reports that the diaphragm has the greatest excursion in supine, which is, the for those mm. of you who don't know this, is the supine is lying on the back. So I've been experimenting, and I find that I have a longer breath when I'm lying on my left side. Oh, it's... because I, yeah, because I'm I'm using three lobes of my lungs on the right side, and that may explain some of it. Uh, but I do I do different breathing. I do it on my back. I do it on my left side, my right side. I do it in prone um, on the abdomen. So I do it in different positions. So I've discovered a big difference in different positioning. It has the least excursion in sitting. Well, that makes sense. That does make sense. Sitting is the position of most compression. Right. Uh, Fortunately, yoga, most breathing is taught in sitting. So, but anyway, I wanted to introduce you to the hummingbird breath. And research has shown that this breath actually helps to clear the sinuses. There are reports of people who have had surgery for the sinuses scheduled mm. and they canceled the surgery because it cleared oh, the sinus. Wow. So I'm going to demonstrate how you do this. Now you keep your mouth closed and what you do is you take a breath in, a deep breath in, and they, t- they tell you in the, in the, 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 the uh, discussion of it, is that you want to begin the breath low down and draw it up through all the way up to the central part of your head where the there's a gland up there, a master gland called the pineal gland. It's a little tiny pea in the middle of your brain. And then you breathe from there with the humming. So this is how it goes. So I'm going to take, take a deep breath. Mm. And then you can hold it as long as you want to, or you can, because eventually you'll run out of breath. I did read that the norms for American adults is between 36 and 50 seconds. Um, I haven't quite made it to 50 yet, but um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can hold it longer than I did there. So everybody, you you won't need to blow your nose for this one because it's not a forced exhalation. It's a hum. Now you can hum, hmm, you can hum, hmm, you can do anyone, you know, however it comes out. For those of you who do yoga, when you chant the sound of om, sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high, sometimes it doesn't matter. And you will feel probably a vibration in your face right. when you do this, okay? So everybody, I'm going to do it with you. I can't hear what's going on. So you're going to do it, Bob? Yep, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it. Okay, we take a deep breath. So that's the humming breath. Now, how many times a day could you do that? I I think you could do it often. (laughs) Very often. Right. You just have to think of it. So yeah. I do it after I brush my teeth in the morning. I do it maybe after I've washed some dishes and I'm just standing there. Or um, I try to do it several times a day. And I actually worked with a patient that I didn't know had any sinus problems. But I always noticed she had kind of puffy cheeks. But she mm-hmm. never mentioned anything about her sinuses or anything. But I taught her the humming breath. And when she did it, all of a sudden she said, <gasps> I can breathe through my left nostril now, uh-huh. you know, just with one humming breath. Can you believe it? So she's doing Very her humming nice. breath. She's doing her humming breath at home. <laughs> I'll bet you. I'm yeah. gonna have my wife try it because she has trouble with her sinuses. So it'll be who's that? My wife. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. I mean that's you know, that's all that's all you do. The other keep thing with the humming, it's very meditative. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, and you can do it again. I do it in all those different positions. I get on my exercise table. I start out in uh, usually in prone, and then I go side lying, side lying, and then back on my back. And, and then I get up and I do one on standing. So I do it in all sure. those positions. Yeah. 
because it's a different uh, excursion of diaphragm. You're getting more or less, you know. Gotcha. Okay, now you need to blow your nose because we're going to do Kabbalah Bhati. This one helps to cleanse the lung. These are these have been researched, these two. There's research articles on that. Yep. So the Kabbalah Bhati is how it is. Um, has a, it's a very active breath, and it's a forced exhalation through the nose. Okay? So I've got my... My, I don't think I need to blow my nose. I already did it this morning. So, oh, I'm, okay, I'm clear. Yeah, make, sure that your, make sure that your nose is clear. Are we having fun yet? Yep, this is fun. <laughs> okay. And the research shows the Kabbalah Bhati breath is a forceful exhalation out of the nose. It can be done through both nostrils at the same time, or also we can do alternate nostril we're going to do the one through the both for this okay? okay it has been shown in research that it cleanses the very deep bronchioles of the lungs and possibly can cleanse the alveoli themselves for those of you who don't know that that's the area in your lungs where your oxygen carbon dioxide exchanges that's deep breathing Okay, so this is the way it goes. You take a breath in. That's it. You just sniff out through your nose. Now you will feel your abdominal muscles. It's strengthening from the abdominals because you're using your abs to, to expel the breath. Sure. And you, you can go at whatever rate you want and for as long as you want. I used to live in an ashram, a yoga ashram. And I used to be able to do that breath a couple hundred times without, you know, stopping. Now mm. I can't do it quite that often. <laughs> I can do a hundred, but, you know, I, I was really, yoga is supposed to be non-competitive, but I'll tell you a little secret. At the ashram, we did have a little competition about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so <clears throat> you've got, you're blowing your nose. So take a breath in and sniff it out. Your in-breath will happen automatically. So you don't go sure. yeah. like that. It's just out, 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 out. You're, let your breath in be passive. That's gotcha. called Kabbalah Bhati. I so like when, I, when I do my exercises for the breathing, I do the Kabbalah Bhati first and then the hummingbird. Gotcha. Because I think I cleanse my lungs. I know I cleanse my lungs. I usually do it twice in each position. And by the time I get to the second time, I've got more breath. Nice. It's amazing. I mean, there's more to the breathing than this, but these are the two, my two favorites, plus the diaphragmatic. Try, give them a try. You're going to be amazed at how breathing affects your life. And Oh, I've got a beautiful, beautiful, and I've tried to figure out a way to, to put it into a um, slide of a gal that has, she's, she's either drawn or taken pictures of the, of the trunk of the body, and she shows how the bones, the ribs move out and in when you breathe, you know, and mm. the diaphragm, how it descends and rises, and uh, she, ro she rotates the if you want to know it, send me an email. I'll, I'll send you the, 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 the one that I have, the, the video that I have, or I'll send you her name and you could look her up. It's just gorgeous. She's an Alexander technique. Uh, sure. Technique. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So you're, in fact, if I put my hands on the sides of my hips when I'm standing and I'm breathing diaphragmatically, I can feel my hips move. Oh. Ah. In which direction? Well, they usually move out when I breathe in, and because mm. the diaphragm is coming down, so it's pushing my hips that, out. You know that far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You may have to stand to do it because it's sure. different. It's different. So that's a little bit on breathing. Probably enough for most of the people here. Also, as a therapist, I address the breath on the first visit. 
Yep. If I, if I don't do anything else, we do that. Okay, so uh, I got a, maybe three or four more slides. The principles of the Meeks method, number one is to unload the vertebral bodies. Now, if you go on most websites about how to manage osteoporosis, they're going to tell you to load your bones. But I can tell you, people can fracture by sneezing, coughing, rolling over, rolling over in bed, opening a window, closing a window, reaching over to get a piece of toast out of the toast. Oh, these are all true stories. Groceries sure. out of the car. Minimal, minimal trauma, you see. So what I want to do, first of all, is unload. And that's how we do it. Now, this uh, skeleton of mine is lying on a foam roller. See? The blue yep. foam roller. The blue foam and roller. Also, also backed up by another one, a bigger one behind it. You sure. don't have to lie on a roller. You lie on your back on your bed. You lie on a, you start. – I've started people in recliner chairs in the ICU, just about anywhere. Just get people lying on their back unloads the vertebral bodies on the front, okay? This is what uh, <clears throat> uh, Dieter Fel Felsenberg said, uh, causes this tensile or lengthening force within the bones. Sure. They don't have any proof of it that I know of. I, he had said there was no research, but that was his idea. And well, there it is. <laughs> Yeah. So that's that's what I do first. And it doesn't matter if the person's 15 years old or 50 or 95 or whatever. That's the first thing we do. We do the decompression. It is the single best exercise that I have found in my patient population for most back pain. This includes people with stenosis, spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, osteoporosis, anything you can imagine, any spinal pathology. I say, what you need to do is lie on your back, unload your back, five to 15 minutes once a day. Do you know how hard it is to do nothing? Right. Sarah, I hear this, what do you mean? I got to lie and do nothing. Yeah. That's really hard to do. I say, well, focus on your breath. <laughs> what, what position should your arms be and legs be? Well, that, that was that was in the realignment routine too. I'll, I'll tell people this. This is called the uh, realignment routine. This is the first thing, the decompression. I have people bring the turn their turn their arms outward, um, and bring them to about midway. I'm going to back up a little bit here. About midway between the shoulders and the hips. Okay. The palms facing up. That helps to stretch out the muscles on the front of the chest. Sure. And, um, and because most everything we do in life is the other way, internal rotation. Yep. This is external rotation. So we want to have a stretch on the pectoral muscles, of both the uh, uh, pectorals major and minor. Um, and also, interestingly enough, on the latissimus dorsi, because one of the main functions of latissimus is to turn the arms in. Yep. We end up as we get older, not able to turn them out all the way, not to externally rotate. So that's how I put the arms. And in decompression, I bend the hips and the knees because I want to isolate the back. Gotcha. I don't know if I sent you the realignment routine. I've, I've sent it out to God, yes, I don't know, a thousand people, I think. I don't know. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, and this is the other area of concern, of course, is the hip. And I like this picture because, you know, I used to think that somehow when you walk, this is weight bearing, that the, the force comes up through your femur and it kind of went straight up. But it doesn't, does it? It makes a turn to go into the hip joint and then up through the body. So uh, that's uh, and I found if I can get a picture with, with a DEXA scan of both the left and the right, there's a difference. There's usually a difference. And I don't know what makes a difference, but oh, interesting. So different. what you're saying with the DEXA scan, uh, the bone uh, tr trabeculi is different, or the density is no, different? no, no, no. Just just what you see here, the oh, angle. Okay, the angle. gotcha. Yeah. It may be different internally, but I don't see that. So this okay. is where most fractures occur, right there. Yeah. Okay. 
The neck of the femur, that top part, this is another part of the treatment dilemma because there are no muscles attached here. Gotcha. They're all around. Yeah. Remember? Around the pelvis, they're all here. Nothing here. So again, how are we going to protect and strengthen this area if you don't have any muscles? Well, again, for me, it's alignment. Okay? That, and that just is to show the alignment. Because I was thinking that either, you know, bone went out or straight up. I don't know what I thought. But anyway, when I started looking really closely, I said, no, it doesn't. It has an angle here. So we have to think about that. So this is the treatment dilemma again. How, how do we strengthen the hip, you know, where there are no muscles? Well, what you do is you strengthen, strengthen the muscles around the hips, the gluteus maximus, gluteus yeah. medius, primarily. Of course, your rotators, I work on the internal rotators, they're usually weaker than the external rotators. Okay, so contraindicated movement. I didn't show this, uh, I've shown this to a lot of people, but uh, uh, this is called flexion of the spine. And you get more compression, as you can see from this picture, if you flex, also side bend or rotate. As a matter of fact, in the spine, what I did read, I have this wonderful book on biomechanics of the musculoskeletal system. It's just great that there is no movement of the spine that occurs in isolation. It's too complicated. Sure. If you flex... If you flex, you're probably also, if you're side bend, you're probably also flexing. If you're flexing, you're probably already rotating or, you know, who knows? Yeah. You ever take a course with um, Shirley Sarman? I've read her book. Yeah. Well, she made a statement. I took her course and uh, uh, that we tend to move in our area of greatest flexibility. What that means to me is that we move the easy side first or the easy element for part. Makes sense. So when we do play golf, tennis, or bowling, those are the big three that are contraindicated in people with osteoporosis. Of course, they can learn to deal with that. There are different ways. Uh, but in any case, if they, you know, they're always twisting and flexing and they're always going in the same direction. And so the same segments will be uh, will be uh, at risk sure. for, uh, for injury, just like carpal tunnel. Yep. So a lot of problems. Uh, I was just reading a, a little blip on uh, Tiger Woods and how many surgeries he's had. Yeah. I'm not quite so many. Woo, my goodness. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. But again, just to um, emphasize here, when she says contraindicated, this is the movement you don't want to do. That's right. Uh, this is uh, the spine is lying on the floor uh, with the face facing upward. I mean, would be so yep. you're bending forward like a sit up almost, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, well uh, abdominal crunches are kind right. of right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, you want to avoid abdominal crunches. Well, besides which, there was a research article done back in 1990, I think where they looked at eight different abdominal exercises and the abdominal crunch was the least effective. Oh, harmful and non-effective. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now I threw this in here because I, and it's kind of not really in context here, but I have a philosophy of treatment that I call the peeling of the onion. And it goes like this. So that's a, obviously a slice of onion in the middle there, right? Yeah. Okay. Red onion, as, a, as it were. Okay. So this is where we begin life in the middle here, you know, where this little being, okay. And then life happens. Okay. On the out. So what happens is we have habitual movements, accidents, injuries, pain avoidance, illnesses, beliefs, personality, lifestyle choices, all of that happens. So, and what happens in the body, if you have an injury, it will automatically compensate so that you don't have pain. Mostly, so you don't have pain. And so you learn to move in a different way to avoid the pain in a lot of cases. So what happens when people come to see me, this is where we are. We're on the outer shell of the onion. 
Now, before I started working with osteoporosis, I used to notice something. I would do an evaluation on a patient. Maybe you've noticed this. And I'd have all the T's crossed and the I's dotted and everything, uh -huh. treatment. And then within two weeks, they'd come in with another symptom. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, okay. So now something new has cropped up, right? And then a couple of weeks later, something else. And I begin to wonder, well, how many problems does this person have anyway? And why didn't they tell me about them? This is, this is when I was young and foolish, you know? Right. And well, then when I worked with the osteoporosis, because I, I had a chance to work just with osteoporosis, what I discovered was it was old injuries and old problems resurfacing. Sure. So the most common thing is the arthroscopic surgery of the knee. Usually they're in and out in one day. They don't get any directions. They just say, go out and do what you want to do. That's fine. Right. And a lot of them lack five or 10 degrees of knee extension. Sure. Yeah. So they're walking with a bent knee. Sooner or later, they're going to have back pain. And then they're going to figure out how to get out of the back pain. And then they're going to have neck pain. And that, you know, it goes on and on. Yep. So when we see them, Bob, we're seeing the outer shell. Yep. It's an, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to brag on myself here. I've been able to take two patients down to a congenital anomaly. Really? Interesting. They, and one of them didn't know anything about it. Ah. Didn't know that she had it. Mm -hmm. She had to go home because she couldn't figure out what the problem with her foot was. And she wasn't helping me out. But then she came back to see me. She says, well, I know what's wrong with my foot. Oh, my aunt told me when I was two years old, I had to wear a special shoe. Oh, ah. Ah. there it is. Congenital it is. anomaly. Well, then I had something to work on. I've been able to change it. I've been able to change tibial torsion. It's just a question of just going deeper and deeper and deeper into this onion. This is assuming that somebody, you know, isn't born with cerebral palsy or some other really serious thing like that. I mean, but foot problems are pretty common in children. So basically, Sarah, you're getting down to the root problem. Yeah, and getting down to what? The root problem. The, the, uh -huh. the problem. The, the, that is the really it, all, all other problems are stemming from that root problem. Yeah. Yep. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. You know, I've been able to in my own body with my own program. I've revisited. I had an accident once in gym. There was a machine or a, a, an apparatus called a horse where you'd run to it and then you'd leap. Yeah. Up yeah. And, well, I, I did that and I did a flip or something. I landed oh on my, my neck. God. I landed on my neck. Oh. Back, you know, back here. And I lost consciousness for a little bit. Oh. I don't know how old I was, 10, maybe 11. I don't know how old I, I was then. I revisited that recently. Well, within the last five years. As I did my program, I could, I could not. So, oh, God, I, I'm getting all these um, sensations back there in the neck where I was injured. And then, wow. I thought of that, then I thought of that accident. Sure. It stay, stays with you. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I think we're just about, I wanted to show my favorite, one of my favorite patients. This is James. He's 94. Um, he had POTS disease, which is TB of the spine, when he was eight years old. So he's had this thoracic hyperkyphosis for 86 years. He's worn every brace that's ever been manufactured for him. Uh -huh. um, he's had different therapies, gone to different doctors, but this is what he looks like at 94. Now he has a sling around his chest. You see that? What yeah. happened when he was 94, this is when I saw him on home care, uh, was that he was on one prescription medication. It was a blood pressure pill. That's it. That's pretty unusual at that age. And then he was having trouble sleeping. So they prescribed a sleeping pill and guess what? He woke up in the middle of the night, he got confused, and he fell, broke his shoulder. Yeah. So that's why I was seeing him, right? But, of course, me being me, I was working on a lot of more things, too. You know, he's 94. 
He's writing his second book. He learned to use a computer when he was 92. I think, man, these are the kind of people I like to work with. That's exactly right. Active like that. So I said, James, let's see how you're doing. I had him stand by his door in his usual way. Okay, now I said, James, give me your best posture. Notice how he can change. Yeah. With a little effort. I worked with him for one hour. There's the result. One hour. People will say that somebody has a, 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 a problem like this for 86 years, it'd be impossible to change. Right. One hour. You know how I changed it? The realignment routine. Awesome. And it lie on his back, shoulder press, head press, leg press, get up, take the picture. I mean, nobody was more amazed than me. Sure. <laughs> This was back in the day when I had to get the film developed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have an immediate thing. You know? Right, the camera on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's an amazing thing because there are a lot of people who think that it takes a long time to change posture. Just lie on the back and then exercise the muscles that matter. Your back extensors, sure. the ones that are responsible for holding you up against gravity. I've had oh. people gain... I've had people gain three inches in one session. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. And we're done with that. Very nice presentation, Sarah. That, I'm that's sorry? Very nice presentation. Oh, thanks. I tried to keep it short and sweet. I don't even know what time it is right now. I can look on my phone. But um, the first question, do you want to ask it? Because I just want to get the breathing out of the way. and then Sure. Uh, you already kind of touched on this, but can you speak yeah. to the role of breathing with exercise? Well, the thing that I, uh, that I, that I wrote here to, to answer, because I didn't say this in the presentation, as you prepare for an exercise, you want to take the breath in. Okay. And then as you do the exercise, you breathe out. This is a yogic principle in breathing, in, in, in exercise. But there is also a principle of movement um, let me see, I have this in here too, um, where the antagonist muscles, what's it called? Um, reciprocal inhibition. Sure. That, when, that when you go to do a movement, uh, let's say that you have to, just for simple you know, presentation, bend the elbow, well, that's your bicep muscle, but the triceps has to relax so the biceps can bend the elbow. It's called reciprocal inhibition. So if you're breathing out, that muscle will be more relaxed and you'll be able to do the movement better. Gotcha. Then if you're holding it, like if you're holding a yoga pose or Pilates or whatever, you don't want to hold the breath. You want to continue to breathe in and out evenly. Yeah. Or sometimes if I'm doing bridging, let's say bridging, that's a pretty intense exercise, you know. A lot of big muscles there working. Yep. Quadriceps and gluteus maximus, back extensors, you know. So I'll do Kabbalabhati while I'm holding the bridge. Sure. Takes my mind off the bridge. <laughs> and, yeah. the pain, and my back pain or whatever's going on. And um, so the breathing, that's, I, did, I did want to bring that up. Okay. Yes. You want, to, you want to do the breathing exercises in different positions because it does affect the diaphragm and then focus on slow. And then we did the demo. So that kind of answers that. Very good. All right. Um, does osteoporosis uh, present with pain? Not usually. It's called the silent condition until a fracture occurs. And then I thought, hmm, most of the fractures are silent. So how can that be true? So what I say is it's a silent condition until a symptomatic fracture occurs. You see, not off, not, uh, I mean, 30%, 20 to 30% of the fractures are the ones that are brought to our attention. The rest are silent. So are a lot of those fractures discovered um, incidentally, like yes. you might be doing yes. an x-ray on something else and you see the... Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And I had a lady lost eight inches of body height 
never had a day of back pain in her life that she could remember. They were wow. all silent. They had to be all silent fractures. Wow. People will say, oh, that's not possible. Well, okay. I've seen it many times. Sure. Yeah. So, no, it does not. And one of the things, I think I have a question on body height here that I'd like to just tell everybody. You, you should keep track of your body height throughout your lifetime. Do not yes. depend upon the medical system to do it for you. They do, I've had a doctor tell me, well, it doesn't change anyway. Why do I need to measure it? I say, oh, wait, what do you, what? Well, let me tell you what I do for a living here. You know, <laughs> I saw a patient once with 10 inches of body height loss. Oh my God. Changes? So you need to keep track. You need to ask when you get weighed, because they always weigh you. Right. To get your height checked. And let's jump right to that question. When is a loss of height an indicator to get screened for osteoporosis? Uh, what number is that? 14. Oh, wow. I just number thought since we were talking about it. Okay. Number, number 14. Number 14? That's what I have. How does the loss of height? Uh oh, you didn't get my new one. No, I didn't 13. get the new one. It says 13 or 12 here. Okay. okay. When should someone get screened? Yep. Okay. Well, I have a few ideas here. The first one I said, a good time would be around the age of peak bone mass, which is in your early 30s. Now, the problem is you're not going to get any insurance to pay for it, probably. But it's not an expensive test. But that would be the time because that's your starting point. When you reach right. your peak bone mass, then you begin a decline throughout life. So you want to know what your original was. So if you can, I think this, the most I've heard for a DEXA scan is about $200. Now, for some people, that would be not possible. Right. Um, but it may... Uh, I'd like to start if we if we get Medicare for all ever or something like that, it might be able to be covered because this starts early. I apparently had it when I was 44 when I uh, had a spiral fracture of my left fibula. I was at the age of 44 learning how to ice dance. Can you believe oh, that? <laughs> I do a weird things uh, and, I, and I and I caught a pick, you know, and I twisted sure. and, you know, and I had the fracture. And so the doctor said to me, he said, God, I don't know why you women won't drink milk. Or something. I said, what, what's he talking about? Uh, that was so probably my first, that was my first sign. So it's basically a baseline. Uh, yeah, baseline. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> definitely within five years of menopause, that's when most bone loss occurs. And that's either surgical menopause, hysterectomy. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Or natural menopause, sometime within within that time period, because the bone loss starts and is quite um, the loss is quite a quite a lot. Um, then I said, well, um, maybe age sixty. And the reason I said that is that uh, the statistics show that over uh, I, I think it's over sixty percent of people over sixty already have the condition. So we should be testing people lower than Medicare age. I got my first official bone density test when I turned 65. And um, of course I was in denial, just like everybody else. Sure. You know? And um, so there, there is that. And then also there are people with comorbidities such as rheumatoid arthritis, people on corticosteroids or other risk factor medications. They should be tested. In fact, sure. I, I think they do a lot of those people annually. Gotcha. Mostly they'll say every two years would be plenty, uh, depending upon what they find. But yeah. I, how, yeah. how much of a loss of height would you uh, be concerned about? Well, I'm concerned with any, but um, there's no number that would indicate that you have osteoporosis. Sure. Uh, now, if you've lost two to two and a half inches, that's indicative of compression fracture. Sure. Mm -hmm. And compression fracture usually indicative of osteoporosis. 
Oh right? yes. Well, unless I've been in an accident, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what else would cause these fragility fractures. But, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now I'm going to number four now. At least my number four. You have said that. <laughs> Number four, uh, should they should not self-select? Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's, uh, okay. So, so I'll, ask the question. I'll read the question. Uh, you have said that people with osteoporosis should not self-select an exercise program. In other words, that's that, correct. They shouldn't yeah. choose their own program. Can you explain why? Well, because many of the exercises that people are doing when they go to the gym, they go to yoga class, Pilates, wherever, they're doing movement that's contraindicated, or at the very least, uh, to use caution with. Sure. But uh, and I and I did. I had a lot of requests for that particular handout after the first podcast. Uh, uh, going to the gym um, and. Yoga and Pilates were the big ones. And there's a lot of people, there's a lot of, uh, well, actually, I just got an email from somebody who said that she went to a therapist who said that he treated osteoporosis. And the first thing he gave her was a yoga pose called the child pose, where you lie down on the floor and you curl up in a little ball. I know it, yeah. Obviously, he doesn't know what to do for osteoporosis. Exactly. So there's, you have to be very careful. You just can't go to the gym and start doing what they ask you to do because they'll be giving you things that are possibly contraindicated. They may give you some things that aren't, you know, but. Sarah, I want to list. That's not what I, I see. Want, I, I want to list your email right now. We'll mention it at the end too, but it, and it's not, it's down in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, but uh, it's, I'm going to read it off here. It's J Harrison, J H A R R I S O N, then the number two at earthlink, just how it sounds, earthlink.net. And again, if you have questions uh, or you're seeking the handout or if you're seeking the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, Sarah will send those to you. Yes. Correct? Yep. Wonderful. And I will also, if you want a, a copy of those slides, uh, well, that'll be on the the PowerPoint. On the, on, well, the PowerPoint will be on your YouTube. Yes, it will. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they wanted the slide presentation separately, I could send that to them too. I don't know if the recording would be on it or not. Probably sure. not. Uh, uh, they can get it on, on there. I, I really like this question. Uh, it's my number five. Are you able to reverse osteoporosis? Oh, yes. Uh, well, you I saw think... part of my answer there, I think. Uh, actually, I think if people can get diagnosed and get to somebody who knows what they're doing right away, I would say yes. Um, that, uh, that it can be reversed with certain movement, getting good weight bearing on the bones, getting, uh, how do I start weight bearing? Well, sometimes it's very simple, just by walking. People aren't walking. Sure. And then I say, no, what you need are random and odd impacts. So you gotta start walking backwards and sideways, but make sure you're safe. Make sure you teach your patients how to do it. A lot of people externally rotate the hip when they go sideways and say, no, you can't do that. That's not the muscle we're after. We want the gluteus medius. So, uh, <clears throat> It would be. To, it would also depend on other uh, uh, comorbidities that they have to deal with. Uh, some people, you know, have difficulty doing. Like people with CO, people with COPD can have difficulty getting started on a program because of their breath. Yeah. You know, so we start with the breath. Uh, but we want to get started right away. And I think I put at the uh, at the bottom here that. Management of compression fractures should begin immediately. Do not wait. Do it on the day of fracture. Oh. That first patient that I saw, I saw her on the day of fracture. Sure. And do you know when I saw her x-ray in six months, her vertebral body has gone back to almost its normal size. Really? But, but you have to get, well, the first rule of fracture management is to reduce the fracture. So if you have a compression fracture, what do you have to do? 
decompress it. Decompress. So my first I story. I had no idea, Sarah, that you could regain the bone height. Yep. If you... I've, I've done it on myself. Oh, myself. interesting. I had an x-ray once, and the doctor looked at my x-ray, and he said, oh, it looks like you've got some compression down at your T11. I, so, of course, I said, what? Let me take a look at that. You know, sure enough, you can see it right there. So I got really busy. I was do, already doing my exercises, but I started to focus on that area more because I know where it is. You know, I have a little advantage to a lot of people. Sure. Next, next x-ray, I was back to normal. Awesome. That is awesome. Um, I'm going to skip to number eight now. Uh, a weighted vest is considered oh, by oh. some to be good for building bone. Yeah. Can you comment on that? I, I well, really the research is what I call puny on it. Okay, there was some research done. There was some uh, improvement, I think, in the hip, primarily. And, but it wasn't really outstanding improvement. Now, also with the weighted vest, I look at it more that it will increase your cardio output because of the added weight. Sure. But one of the things that has happened, the good old American way, with but with weighted vests, a lot of the vests, you carry the weight on the shoulders and people start complaining of shoulder pain. Now, when I was, now this was the dark ages, right? A PT student, I learned that when you carry extra weight in the body, you want to carry it down below the navel, the center of gravity, which is an S2, your sacral segment two, that's below your navel. So there was a weighted vest called a walk vest, and I still have one, but it's not being manufactured. But I'd, yeah, I'd like to, maybe you could get it manufactured. <laughs> well, look, you've got a lot of products. Why not well, that one? That's true. But what, it, what, it, what it was, it looked, first of all, it looked like a vest. Secondly, you carried the weight below the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pelvis here. Right. Okay. And so I used to, you know, I, I figured, hmm, well, so I got, I think, how many pounds did they send me? 10 pounds, I think, little one pound weights. And I thought, oh, God, 10 pounds, that's nothing, right? All right. <laughs> you try it, 10 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I went out and tried to walk. I, I just piled in the weights and went for a walk, and I got like halfway down the street, and I said, geez, this is work. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I was running marathons then, you know, so, sure. so I cut it out. I, you know, I, I went down to two pounds. Uh -huh. And you put the weight in the back first. You see, that's where you carry the weight best. Sure. Like, like these little fanny packs, you know. And yeah. then and then it, in the circle. So it's called a walk vest. You can probably still find it on the internet. And I have one. If you, if listen, if Bob and Brad want to manufacture it, I, it's all yours. It's not my original anyway, so sure. but I have one. <laughs> well, actually, speaking of products, Sarah, I do want to show two of your products, if that's all right. Oh, oh, uh, sure. Oh, uh, yes, uh, yes. Oh, yes. I want the. You got the rollers. Oh, uh, the foam rollers. Yes. Okay. Uh, this one, um, it's really quite soft. So I take yes. it it is for someone who may be osteoporotic and maybe less tolerant of a more. <laughs> dance roller um we're going to do a video on this um so i'd like to hear your comments about it um, oh you're going to do a video yeah we're going to do a video on both of these this is the oh, other okay. one this is your half uh roller this is a half turn it over so you can see the flat side that's got a. this is the one that i frequently start with because of course i see people who are really well, average age 75, you know, so they, you know, so I start them on the half roller. In fact, you know the spinal med brace? Uh, the price? The, no, the spinal, do you know the brace called the spino med? Oh, I don't, no. You don't? Oh, I need to talk about that. Well, just, well anyway, the patient James, my patient James that I yep, showed. Yep, yep, that, yep. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Well, one day I had him on, he was in a hospital bed in his apartment, and I had him lie on the half roller. And he said, oh, this is just like a brace, Otofield. Now, this ah. guy's wore, worn every brace under the sun in his lifetime, right? And this light bulb went off in my mind, 
I said, of course. Why are we bracing the front of the body? Why aren't we bracing the back? Sure. So I envisioned a support that went up the back, had an abdominal thing, an abdominal piece, because they all like the pressure on the abs. Yeah. And then a couple of shoulder straps to hold the whole thing all together. I tried, I went to three different orthotests and tried to get them to make me a prototype. Oh, can't be done. Won't be strong enough. A lot of, I have an excuse in the book. And then I went to a meeting out in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, with the uh, National Osteoporosis Foundation. And there, sitting on a table, a little uh, uh, expo that they had, was the spinal bed. And I, oh. and I saw, I went, I were running over and I said, oh, there's my brace. <laughs> so the guy said, his name is Ed Wilborn. So the guy said, what do you mean you're brace? You know, he's like six foot two and I'm five foot two on a good day. <laughs> and what do you mean you're brace? And I told him the whole story about dreams, you know. And, uh, and he said, oh, he said, well, would you like to try it on? I said, would I? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, well, why don't you wear it for a while? Oh, okay. And I went all over the conference and take, dragging sure. every PT I could back to see the spinal med brace. And then he let me take it home. Oh, wow. And that was the beginning of my journey with Medi, M-E-D-I, USA, Medi, USA. They have a, a manufacturing plant in North Carolina. Sure. But the main manufacturing is in Germany. At the same time that I was envisioning that, I mean, I envisioned that whole thing just like it was in yeah. my mind. At the same time that I envisioned it over in Germany, a, a doctor, okay, Dr. Minna is his name, was doing the same thing. And only he, he had the staff and he had the money and he had the patients sure. and he had all of that. And he had a company behind them. So they designed the brace. It is the brace for osteoporosis. So you, it strengthens. Would you say that name again? Spino med. S P I N O M E D. Spino. Okay, gotcha. The website is Medi, M E D I U S A. And if you go on there and get in their orthopedic department, you'll see pictures of the Spino med. You'll find a uh, a video of Ed Wilborn, who is the pa he he traveled with me, or we traveled together everywhere around the United States, Europe, uh -huh. everywhere. Oh yeah, and he'd come in and show off the spina med, and then we all go out to dinner, and, you know, have uh -huh. a social and like that. But he's not with Medi anymore; somebody else is. Oh it sure. Is, it's the only brace, Bob, that strengthens the body part that it is designed to protect, gotcha. namely the back. I will definitely okay. check that out. It is like magic. Awesome. Awesome, spinal med. Mm -hmm. so I, I, see, I got the idea with one patient. Sure. And if you get an idea, here's my word to the wise, if you get an idea, act on it. Because somebody else in the universe has got the same idea. Seems like that Dr. happens Mina. a lot. You know? Now, with this, uh, yeah. with this one, do, will you lie on this lengthwise, or do you use yes, the other one yes. too? Yes, your sacrum goes at one end and your head the other. It's so 36 tailbone inches. on one end, yeah. head on yeah. the other. Head on the other, yeah. And it's 36 inches long, and I have found that the 36 inches, interestingly enough, will fit somebody up to six foot five inches tall. Oh, well, that's, I'm so six I guess six. pretty much most of our body height, I know, I know you're taller than I am, but most of it's in your legs, not your back. Yeah, that's right. I'd be fine, I think. So <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Uh, when a patient had, I got number nine on mine. When a patient has had one or more compression fractures, yes. procedures often done called a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, there's also a device called a bone jack. <laughs> Can you tell us about those procedures and how you manage a patient? Yes. With yes. yes. Uh, well, first of all, any of these procedures, I would do the same protocol, physical therapy, with any of these procedures. A kyphoplasty is if you have a compressed vertebra, what they do is they insert through a needle a what they call a 
uh, balloon tamp. Mm. And then they inflate the balloon to raise the height of the vertebral body. And then they fill the vertebral body with a substance called polymethylmethacrylate, which is bone cement, basically. Sure. And that has uh, an advantage to people of taking away pain pretty quickly. Unfortunately, if you have osteoporosis, now you have a piece of cement butting up against the other osteoporotic bodies. So there can be adjacent fractures that occur with this. Sure. Vertebral vertebral plasty is the same as kypho, except they don't use the balloon, the inflated balloon. They just go in and put the cement. Now, it occurred to me, uh, because there is a, a, a condition called osteonecrosis, which I think I have a, I had a question on that, yeah. which, means, which means death of bone usually occurs in people with silent fractures but I'm, I, I'm curious about necrosis in these procedures because if you fill the body with cement, you know, you don't have any arterial circulation in the bone. Right. 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 I, don't, I don't know about the statistics. I've kind of lost that. On. Now, the bone jack, this is interesting. This looks just like a car jack. Oh, but it's my about God. This big, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and I don't know how they do that, but they, they put this. I, I don't know. But I, I read about it. I don't know now how much they're doing with it, but with the bone jack, which would be, which to me would be probably better than the cement. But, sure. Look, but I use the same protocol. The same for treatment protocol. of them. Yes. Sure. No changes. Now, speaking of new things, there's a, a new test for bone quantity and quality. It's called the Echolite. Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's you, ultrasound technology. Can you tell us about that? Well, it's uh, not much because I've only uh-huh. seen one, one, one of my patients. She just goes everywhere and does everything to, you know, treat herself the best she can. So she went to a Good. show and she had the test done. And uh, you can look it up. It's a really beautiful um, result that they give you on the, on, the, on the printout. And it's also supposed to be, I haven't had... I only learned about it last week, you know, or the week before. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's supposed to also give us a readout on bone quality, which is oh, interesting. Which is related to fracture risk. See, the bone right. quality is not related to fracture risk. And Bob, I'm going to tell you something. I just went on a little in, into PubMed. You know, uh-huh. there has there has been research on bone quality for years. And they're still doing the bone quantity. Yeah. Well, you know, they pay thousands of dollars for these machines. You're not, you're not going right. to No, but yeah. bone quantity, the DEXA scan, is not related to fracture risk. It is the internal structure of the bone, the mineralization of the bone, the architecture of the bone, and the presence of micro damage. I did look up a little bit of information. We talked about this on the mineralization. Yeah. It starts in utero, mineralization of the bone. And then when the baby is born, a lot of the uh, deposition of minerals and so on depend upon movement. Well, you know what's happening with our babies. They're not moving. Right. So we have it's an epidemic bad, now. of it's a bad start to life. <laughs> it is. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I, have, I usually present that in my seminars. There's a lot of problems with children because of it. Sure. Yeah. I want to get to a couple of these questions too. Um, and I think you have it on here too, but uh, jogging and running are considered oh, yeah. good exercise yeah. for building stronger bones. Is running safe for a 50 year old woman with osteoporosis? Well, I say here, it is a mistake to base it on age. First of all, because there are people in their nineties that have healthy bone and people in their adolescence and twenties that, that don't. So it's not really an age related thing. Sure. Now, the problem with running, they did, there's an article by uh, the fellow's name is Nykander. I think it was about 2000, and somewhere between 2010, 2015. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, they looked at uh, eight different exercises 
to build strong bone in the hips. And the, the least effective exercise is swimming. Right behind, right behind that is cycling. Makes sense. And right behind that is running. So the problem with running, because a lot of people depend upon that for weight bearing, but the thing is that down here in the South, we have an expression called same old, same old. They go out the door with the same old person. They go on the same old route. They go at the same old pace. They never change. And then they got their workout done and they come home. Well, yeah. the highest, the, the best development of bone was in the high and triple jumpers. Well, of course, you know, we're not going to be doing that with our patients. Sure. But the next group was soccer and handball. So why would they have better bones? It's called random and odd impact movement. Gotcha. So even if you're doing home care, and now, you know, if somebody's on home care, they're at a fairly low level of activity. Mm -hmm. So what I used to do, and I still do, well, I don't do home care now, but anyway, I take them in the kitchen, they hold on the kitchen counter, and I teach them to walk backwards. I teach them to walk sidewards. You know, I try to, okay, so what do you do? You go out and get the mail? All right, so you go out and get the mail, and you walk on your cement driveway. Get over on the grass. So you have odd impact if you're safe, you know, I mean, it's all right. safe. but you try to try to figure novel ways where you can get different impacts on the bone. So in running now I've run four marathons, lots of, um, uh, what do you call it? Where you swim and bike and then run and uh, triathlon and, and everything like that. I've done, a, I've done a lot of that. So when we used to train for that, um, what we would do is it's called in Swedish. Are you ready? I'm ready. Fart lift. Fart lift. Oh, yeah, I knew that. You knew that. I knew Fart that, lift. yes. So you say you're running along, you say, oh, you see that telephone pole over there? Okay, when we reach the telephone pole, and then you see down there, there's the, the end of the street, and there's a big oak tree or something like that. I say, so when we get to the telephone pole, you're going to go run as fast as you can to the end of the street. And then you go back to your usual thing. And then you come to maybe a fire hydrant or you come to some other landmark and say, you know, see, we'll get to there. We're going to turn around and we're going to go backwards or we're going to go sidewards or we're going to skip or, you know, whatever we're going to do. We're going to vary the forces or we're going to get off the street and go in the grass. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, or go out on a trail. We used to run around the North Florida hospital here with that. Now they've, expanded so much couldn't do it anymore but they used to have these wonderful trails out behind the hospital you know we go out in the trails and, sure. you know, as long as you don't trip over a tree root you're in business <laughs> well right along that same vein what about uh mini tramp oh the trampoline well this is interesting a lot of people have trampolines now so i looked up trampolines on the internet do you know that they make trampolines now everyone's got a cage around them yeah you can't fall off it Right. Well, that was one of the issues was balance. Okay. Now they, there is a research effect. I have it here somewhere on my desk, a research study done on uh, athletes, uh, trampoline athletes. Now they're, they're operating on a big trampoline right. in the gym, right? They're not one of these little round things. Right. Okay. Yeah. And it, they have shown bone development in these athletes. Now, I tell you, none of my patients are athletes. Right. Well, actual, actually, there was a fellow that said one time, he was a famous runner. He said, basically, we are all athletes. It's just that some of us are in training and some of us are not. Yeah, so, good point. <laughs> so no more guilt. So <laughs> with that guy, yeah. uh, he, was a, he was a doctor, he was a very famous runner, runner doctor. So the little trampoline, of course, doesn't have the kind of uh, force that the bigger one will have. So sure. I don't know. My, my originals, I, in terms of weight bearing, I'll tell you what, there is nothing that beats being on your feet, using your back extensors to push you through space, strengthening the muscles of your hip, you know. And then if you want to increase the pace, you know, you'll get some poles and start walking with poles and then maybe start jogging a little bit because that will increase the weight. But you need to vary the force. Your bones go to sleep. 
If you do the same thing every day, they just stay the same. Sure. Want to strengthen well, your bones? You have to challenge the bones. You want to mention the, uh, I can't remember what you called it, but it was the kind of the heel drop. Oh, the bump, bump. Bump, bump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You go up on the ball of the foot and then you just drop down like that. Yeah. You could do that. It's, it's like humming breath. You can do it almost anywhere. Yeah. yeah you can do it anywhere. Except driving. But <laughs> so I don't really recommend trampolines, except it's like stationary bicycles, you know, or treadmills. Treadmills. Yeah. You, you miss the extension, you know, that you're just following a moving platform. You're not getting your, yeah. your hips, stre you're strengthened. But, you know, I used to live in the frozen north, you know, northern New York State up on the Canadian border, and that's sure. where you live too, right? So I used to use a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a treadmill sometimes in the winter. Right. But there were, I mean, I'm, I remember I used to just get dressed and I'd put on my boots and everything and I'd have a mask on my face and everything and I'd go out 30 below temperature up by the river and I'd do my workout, you know, my run or my walk. My, uh, going through the snow and ice, I wasn't sure. just uh, running, you know, but I was, I was out doing it because I wanted to run a marathon in New York and I had to train, so. Yeah, you can't get away did. from it. But, but if you have inclement weather like that, you could, you know, you can use a trampoline instead. But, you know, I have people that just depend on, on the treadmill all the time. It's not yeah, I'm, the same. I'm, I know we're, we're go, out of time. Yeah, we're going to go one more question, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. I'm, well, I'm here for you. Well, I, this is number 19 on my sheet. Uh, what are a few of the best things that a person oh. recently diagnosed can do with osteopathy? Okay. All right. Well, I have as number one on my cheat sheet here to accept the diagnosis. Now, there is a, are you familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross? No, I don't know that name. Well, she was a psychiatrist. She wrote a book called Death and Dying. And she used to work with dying patients. And she realized that when anybody had a diagnosis of, you know, a fatal diagnosis, cancer, whatever, they go through stages. They go through denial. They go through frustration. They go through anger. They go through acceptance. And then they go through this whole cycle again until they come around to acceptance. And then once they do that, then they can deal with it. It's the same thing with osteoporosis. I got my report, right? And here I was, I was a uh, Olympic style weightlifting champion on the world level and on the national level. I was running marathons, doing triathlons. I mean, I was an athlete, right? Sure. Working out and everything. I get my report and I said, oh no, they got me mixed up with somebody else, right? Sure. Total denial. Total denial, right? And I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. So I went through all those stages, just like she. She has got a great book called Death and Dying. I, I went to a seminar with her once. She's this little, she's shorter than I am. <laughs> little, little bitty person. She's from Europe. I forget what, what country. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it was a four-day seminar on death and dying. Right after my mother died. Oh, boy. That was oh, boy. Yeah, uh, well, I learned a lot, you know, from her. But anyway, she's got this, she calls it stages of grief. Sure. When you get a diagnosis of anything like this, you're going to go through stages until you reach acceptance, and then you can do something about it. Then I said, seek out medical professionals who are trained in the management of this condition. That can be a real challenge. Now, I tell the people that come to me for consults, I have a huge list of people that have taken my training. And... Um, of course, now I'm not teaching anymore, so the list is getting older, so people retire and so on. Mm -hmm. But I do still have a, people, a lot of people practicing. And so I'll, I'll look for someone in their area, and if I find someone and they go to them, it's really a good deal. And then I can, can collaborate with a therapist. But like I, I think I already said this today, you can call any, uh, any physical therapist on the, on the, in the United States, and they'll all say that they work with osteoporosis, but yes, it doesn't mean it's right. <clears throat> So you want to seek out somebody that, that knows what they're doing. Um, if you have back pain, or, or if even if you do not, 
get down in the decompression exercise and take the load off five to 15 minutes at a time. You can stay longer if you like, you know, fall asleep or something. Um, one to five times daily. I mean, I've had people in my, it, this exercise makes people feel so good. They want to do it. But right. then, then it goes along with some guidelines. No reading, no texting, no watching TV, no, no, uh, no cats, no dogs, no kids, no lifting. Somebody wanted to know she could lift weights while she's lying. Oh, there. Nice. oh no weights, no weightlifting. You know, so, no, you just lie there and let your back relax. There would be an advanced version. I got a couple more. I got a couple more. Sure. Uh, if you consider taking medication, do your homework. Look at the benefit versus risk. Be sure you want to take it if you decide to take it because it can be difficult getting off it. Sure. And then I said, reduce negativity of thought. You can live a full life with osteoporosis, but you will need to modify movement to be safe. You know, people have their favorite exercises. Do you, have you ever done yoga? I have not done yoga, no. You know what the, you know what the, uh, oh, what's that, what's that called? It's not the plow. Yeah, it's the plow, I think. Okay. You lie on your back and then you lift your legs up and you bring your feet over behind your head. I know, I know the plow. I know it. Okay. That's yeah. the first one. I, that's the first one I had to give up. Sure. Yeah, I think I cried. I think I cried because I had worked very hard at perfecting it. Sure. <laughs> but the back is maximally flexed when you're in that plow. Position. No kidding. No, no, no. So, you know, I had to give up things. But then what happened to me is, well, I said, this is the uh, lemonade, you know, the lemons turning into lemonade. Because that, right. that's, that, that's when I started to work with the patients, all who had osteoporosis. I began to really focus on that program. And man, did I learn a lot there. I don't. What a difference you've made, Sarah. Just a well, I guess. Yes. Okay. Some days I wake up and I wonder, but you know, <laughs> I, I just keep doing it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to thank you again for taking the time. And uh, mm -hmm. again, her email is jharrison2 at earthlink.net. I'm going to spell this out J H A R R I S O N 2, the number two, at earth link.net and it, it, she'll send you some materials and she'll answer questions and uh she's a great resource so check it out and check out her last video too which was overcoming the osteoporosis oh no i'm sorry this that's this one the last one was osteoporosis there is something you can do and it was an interview with sarah so yeah. check that one out we'll have it linked yeah. below too I would like to just add one thing because there may be people on this podcast that did have not watched the first one. Right. And I have about 10 documents that I can send, but if they send me the email, please let me know that they want the, the handouts for the first podcast because sure. I have different handouts for this one. They include the use of the foam roller, and I show, and there's a, uh, uh, I think there's a uh, uh, video on my website that shows how to get on the roller. I'm not sure of that though, but uh, basically I describe how to get on it because you don't just lie down on the end of it and then lie down. You you take the roller, you you wedge it up behind your back, and then you roll up onto it because you don't want to get those flexion forces in your spine. Uh, so, and then I have a document that has a list of exercises. You know, you lie on the roller and you have your hands on the floor and your feet on the floor, and then you pick up one arm, then you pick up the other arm so that you're balancing. It's a balance. Sure. Okay. Thing. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, movement there. Therapy, um, make sure you send that to me. Yes. Like, send uh, me an email, request it, will you? Because okay. sometimes I forget about you because sure. you're really hard <laughs> I'll send um, you an email. I will also add. Um, I'm going to send them a picture of how to do prone positioning, how to lie anybody because people say, Oh, I can't lie on my stomach because it makes my back hurt. Well, you put a pillow under your hips, right? Maybe two pillows. I don't know. You know, yep. you can do it. So 
Uh, you can get started anyway. The pelvic press, which is done in prone, the head lift. Now the realignment, you do a head press. Okay, now that's that idea I got from, um, oh God, what's his name? He was like back in the 70s. He's no longer living. Uh, uh, McKenzie. Yeah, McKenzie. Okay. He, he has the this movement. Right, you know? the chin tuck. But none of my patients could do it. So I, then I had this lady lying on her bed in supine. And all of a sudden I said, oh, she's perfectly safe. Her head is supported on her bed. You know, all I have to do is have her lift the chin a little bit so she gets an arch in her neck and press her head into the bed. Oh, same thing. Works. You know? yep. So it's called a head press. And then the head lift. When you lie prone, put your hands here, and then you lift straight up. Not like this. Sure. Straight up. Okay, so I've got that there. And then upper back strengthening. And I also have a document on walking for exercise. Uphill, downhill, you know, all around the barn. I can't wait to check them out. I okay. We'll send you an email. So Send me a reminder. Yep, I'll send you a reminder. So, all right, well, we'll finish it up there. And uh, thanks again, Sarah, for being on the, on the program. Well, depending upon your response you get from this one, I'd be willing to do another one because uh, no I've, I've got a couple of yeah. things that I didn't address here. <laughs> we'll, we'll be willing to do that. Okay. Sure. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. But I think two months is a good space. Sure. Between. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, and yep. thank you all for attending.